Welcome to the second In Conversation webinar event organized by the um, Icon Textile Group. I'm Anne French and I'm the current chair of the Textile Group and it is my great pleasure to be hosting this In Conversation with Sheila Landy. But before we start, I've just got to do some webinar housekeeping to run through. First, you will all be muted throughout and you will only ever be able to see Sheila, myself or her PowerPoint on your screens. Second, we are recording this webinar about which you should have received notification and we plan to make it available in due course should you miss anything. Also, please remember that we're all on our home Wi-Fi and if you do have any issues to report or there are any complications, please let us know in the chat box and we will do our very best um, to get things going again, but bear with us. We asked for tech questions in advance to help plan a structure for this conversation. And many thanks to all of you who sent them um, through to me and therefore to Sheila. If you have any further questions for Sheila during the event, please use the Q&A facility at the bottom of your screens, not the chat box. And we will be collating all the questions as we go, and we will really hope to add them to the conversation. But if we don't get round to covering them, Sheila has kindly um, agreed to answer them in writing after the event, and we will make them available. Right. For me, Sheila needs no introduction because I was in fact her last um, textile conservation student apprentice at the V&A. And to this day, I recall a rather terrifying interview process in the boardroom. But for those of you who are less familiar, Sheila Landy trained in fine art at Kingston and the Royal Academy schools before joining the textile section of the conservation department at the Victoria and Albert Museum in 1963, becoming head of section in 1972. Due to conservation as a discipline, still being in its infancy, Sheila played a key role in its development, both within the museum and in the establishment of the profession in a wider sense. She has had many articles published and has also written the Textile Conservators Manual, which is now in its second edition, which is a revised one from the first. On her retirement from the V&A in 1989, Sheila continued to work in private practice, establishing the Textile Conservation Consultancy, which became the Landy Company in 2008. Sheila. To start, what do you think your most co important contribution to the field of textile conservation was, is? I would like to think it was an attitude of mind. Uh, open to anything that might help in dis decision making. Uh, to think the impossible, even when it has to be rejected. In other words, think outside the box to respect the object, but never be afraid of it. If you are, you are in the wrong job. That I think is my attitude to most things. And how did it, how did you try to put that into practice? How did I try to put it in practice? Ah, uh, all the very odd things that I've done. And um, I think that that's outside the box at the moment. <laughs> so what did you enjoy most and what was the most difficult then? Uh, bearing in mind that I am still working, I think for the first part of the question is the arrival of a new object in the workshop, especially when large and complicated. And for the second, it was my first few years as head of section when the job wasn't actually recognised as being managerial. And so no help was given whatsoever until it was far too late. I even had to sit in the middle of the room for an office. 
there wasn't anyone anywhere else. Uh, and even though there were up to 14 people sometimes for whom I was responsible, I had to learn the hard way about management. And many would probably say I never did, but there we go. <laughs> did you realize back in 1963 how important textile conservation would become to you when you first started? Was it a career? Oh, good Lord, no. I sh it's, uh, I'd been 10 years since leaving art school uh, and I was just looking for a job vaguely connected with art uh, and I was first employed as a craftswoman in the VNA. It just happened to be textiles but it might just as well have been any of the other specialties. I was plenty qualified enough to have been a picture restorer for example. My career in textiles was purely accidental. So you didn't actually apply, you just, it was just the advert was for a craftswoman, it wasn't to be to join the textile section at all? Uh, well it did say the textile section and I just thought oh well let's give it a go and got the job. The rest is history. Who interviewed you, can you remember? It was Norman Brumell, uh, and the museum superintendent, uh, Mrs. Burkhill wasn't allowed to interview people in those days. And I think it was somebody from personnel as well, who I can't remember now. Because Mrs. Burkhill was the, was she the, she was the head of section at that point, wasn't she? Yes, she was. Uh, she was already 69. Um, and uh, retired a year later. Can you remember what your first object at the V&A was? Yes, it was a saddle for an elephant with a lot of sequins, which I had to re-stitch. I hated that thing by the end. <laughs> Every time I wanted to do something else, oh, write up some notes. <laughs> what, I don't know. <laughs> When do you think it started to become a career for you rather than just oh. being an interesting job? Well, first of all, um, it happened that the VNA was running an Opus Anglicanum exhibition at the time of my joining, which was a wonderful demonstration of textiles as art. Mm. So as an artist, that completely opened my eyes for something. But then for the, about the first seven or eight years, I was also trying to keep up my painting as a, uh, my training. So that was what I was trying to do. But by the early seventies, when it was in fact likely I was going to become the head of department, I'm rather an all or nothing sort of person. So, uh, I deliberately gave up painting. There wasn't room in my life for two such demanding activities. Uh, I thought at that time that I had more to give to conservation than I had to art, the world of art. But uh, ironically, on my 90th birthday, uh, an exhibition of 20 odd of my old paintings was put on by a friend who runs a gallery here and I sold 50% of them, which I was rather proud of. <laughs> so that was a bit of coming back to it. Um, yes. What would you like to be remembered for? Oh, goodness, I leave that to those who remember me enough to give my, forgive my many faults. I suppose I could say um, the writing of the first practical conservation of a uh, book about conservation of textiles and amazingly even after all this time it still sells about 10 or 12 copies a year and there's quite a healthy uh, trade in second-hand copies I believe. 
Yes, and I remember because you were you were still you were writing it when I joined the BNA, and you you um you sort of pioneered the use of a word processor, which seems quite remarkable now. Uh, yes, I bought my first computer in uh, 1980 with the uh, second revision of the book. Uh, I could no longer tolerate having to do it by typing on an awful old typewriter, cutting and pasting, and then getting it typed by somebody else and cutting and pasting again. So uh, that first computer was a godsend. So if we were to move on to um, some of the objects um, that you've worked on, I was wondering if you thought there were, whether there were objects that can never be conserved. Would you be prepared to let an object just go? Yes. One of my favourite sayings is nothing lasts forever. And that's why I can sleep at night. There is definitely a point of no return in an object beyond which you might as well not bother is more destructive than helpful. And it's an actual condition of the fiber that has broken right down, that it has become so brittle that you really cannot handle it. It's most often in archeological textiles, as you can see on the screen, uh, the one in the middle at the top comes from uh, the tomb of T Tutankhamun and is virtually carbon. That could not be touched, really. It was very, very carefully stored in a drawer and has been left. I don't know whether it's dust or not by now, but you couldn't do anything with it. Uh, on the left, uh, on the right of the screen, underneath our, our faces, I don't think we can do much about that, but there is a piece of the same a fabric from the same collection that was opened up. And I did try to do what I could to consolidate it. I did what I could with what we'd got at the time. It was an adhesive uh, on net, which was totally really unsuitable but that was what we had. It tended, eventually it was backed up with something else to separate it all. And maybe the remains of it still is in a drawer somewhere in the VNA, but I don't know. Haven't seen it for many years. But on the left, there are fragments from the Eleonora of Te Toledo's um, gown that was found in the Medici tombs in about 1590, 1575, I think. Now, strangely, it's fragmented, but you could handle it. it the fragments were washed and ordered and mounted. Again, it had to be on an adhesive uh, in such a way as to explain its construction which you can see underneath. It's nothing to do with age. It's something to do with uh, the constitution of the fiber. What happens to it? I don't know. In the middle, I will come back to that one. That's the pleated tunic that uh, also comes from the Fayum area, but uh, um, could be, is, older than anything here. That's 3, 000, over, well over 3,000 years old. Uh, 3,000 BC, I mean. So it's 5,000 years old. Older than it was first thought to be. But I will come back to that. So, in another question. Yeah, I mean, these two, ob these objects you've got on the screen are really um, very complicated and You've talked about investigating and getting to know an object. 
Ah. Uh, and I wondered what you thought was the best way to document what you found, have what you find with an object, and how have you seen that change since you started? Uh, the greatest change has been in the recognition that it actually matters. Uh, when I started in the uh, VNA, documentation consisted of a brief description on the front of a small reference card with a request with what work should be done from the curator. Uh, they never discussed it. It was said, please put it on net, put it on a board, wash it. And my favorite was one that came up with a request to wash and on the back which, where we were supposed to put what we'd done uh, and what we'd used was the word washed. I loved it. So when you started you were told what to do by the curators did you did were you able to discuss at all or did it just come as a uh, later yes but not in the first time not in the first instance. Uh, for the first five years, really, it was definitely dictated by the departments of what should be done. Norman Brumell was struggling to set up a truly independent conservation department, and it, which happened in the end, but um, took a long time. So which kind of object did you find you could start to do more detailed investigation and be more independent with? Oh, well, I suppose you stymied me there. I can't remember. <laughs> it is a while ago. It is a while ago. Uh, there were so many objects that went through my hands that I can't remember. I suppose it started with uh, a set of flags from Westminster Abbey that we did as grace and favour um, when I was working quite independently. I, it was difficult. It's crept in, shall we say that sort of independence of the conservation people as professionals in their own right. But it took a long time. And, and so to getting back, how, how do you, what changes have you seen in documentation? Uh, the computer, forms and boxes. It's not my, I don't think it's, an easy thing to document anyway. Uh, language can be misinterpreted. Photography doesn't always show what you want it to show. Uh, and although, as I say, the development of the computer has made a difference, but I think it tends to be a bit more forms and boxes, but personally, I still remain as a somewhat discursive documentator. I don't care. <laughs> I write an essay. And, and do you like drawing objects? There's never time. Right. <laughs> uh, but I think my reasons for emphasizing and getting to know an object by investigation as such is to avoid any kind of misinterpretation. Now we've got on the screen here an, uh, uh, an object which comes from my experience in Burley House. It's not Burley House, uh, but um, it's a small, Tudor embroidery. Uh, discoveries made can totally change your understanding and dis interpretation of the object. This piece, it's an, uh, an embroidery, late Tudor, about 1600 perhaps, 
Uh, and while it was being examined, certain signs became obvious. But it had been cut in two pieces down the middle and hidden one in each of those two stools in the middle there under the padding and under the upholstery. And I think it had probably been uh, belonged to a Catholic family and it was a small altar frontal. But when all of the rest of it had been taken away, I, I saw some little signs of stitching and they were in the pattern and in the place where some rings might have been for it to be hung. That it could have been just an ordinary hanging a, a decorative panel or whatever, but those little ring marks definitely meant it had been hung and with the vaguely Christian um, emblems. It, and just the whole aspect of it, once you'd got it together, it was a little altar frontal that they'd cut up and hidden so it wasn't destroyed. Remember the 17th century was full of um, uh, persecution for Catholics in various bouts through the whole century. So it might have been, uh, the stools are more, um, later in the century anyway so and it had been well used so it was but sort without of... that discovery it I mean it put a whole new di dimension onto it and that if it hadn't been really and truly very closely examined it wouldn't have been found and would you say also that your, you know, the, the, the number of objects that you've worked on over the years taught you what to look for? Oh, yes. Oh, yes. It's infuriating for the girls who work for me because I say, oh, yes, that's something. <laughs> something's come in. Uh, you get to recognise. That's the whole thing. I think documentation is very, very difficult. And it's very difficult for anybody else to know anything about it. Um, I once tried to set up a website for the gathering together of pieces of information that could be dated, could be classified. Everybody said, oh, what a good idea, but then couldn't take part because of, of copyright and um, intellectual property issues. IIC itself wanted to set up a similar site because they thought it was a good idea on a worldwide basis. But no, it was this copyright business. So if people are hanging on to bits of knowledge, how does it get disseminated? I don't know. I really don't know the answer to it. So what would have been your most enjoyable job and your least enjoyable job? Ah, uh, there's a, um, an infinity to choose from. <laughs> I really don't know how to start. I mean, the, highlights, the museum, <laughs> the earthic bed, the Archbishop Walter de Grey's pillow, the Arderbill carpet, mounting the 1984 costume court, the Jackson chair and stool. Uh, they're all, they were all wonderful um, experiences. Um, each decade brought its own example. Well, okay, I will go back to the fine pleated tunic as probably one of the most intense. I had, we did this program for, um, on the outside works scheme at Osterley for the Flinders Petrie Museum, the UCL. 
of trying to rehouse a whole collection of fragments, which all came in sacks, and we just emptied them out onto a cloth on the floor and to be able to sort them. And in this one, I spotted some pleated fabric and thought that looks interesting. And sorting it out, it was a plain tunic with pleated sleeves. Uh, and this is an example of something where I could do something about it. I had two weeks free and lobbied the keeper of my keeper, Norman Brumell, and Donald King, keeper of textiles, to see if I could actually be allowed to do the work because it wasn't a museum object. And uh, I had two weeks free, and they're the most intense two weeks I've ever had. I did that conservation and built the body for it. And we found so much information about how it had been made, how it had been used, that it had definitely been worn by a human being. But I think now, that might have been well left as something, as, a, as it is, as it was, because the whole fashion of, of conservation has changed. It's become much more interested in the social history of things. Well, I'm a full-blooded, old-fashioned, uh, nature, true nature of the object kind of conservator, and I make no apology for that. And that is the way I approached that one what, all those years ago. What information do you think would have been missed if you hadn't treated the object in the way you did? The fact that it had been properly worn by a human being, the way the creases were, the way in the arms, uh, in the elbows and under the arms, um, the way it had been made, the fact that it had definitely been stitched by somebody right-handed, uh, all that kind of information, the pattern of the sleeves, the way they'd been cut, and that each one was cut in the same way, so one of them twisted in a funny way. This has been published, so um, people can find it if they're interested. But that would have been missed because how could you have found it out? Um, and if we move on to what about your least enjoyable piece? Is there a oh, piece? Frankly, I pass that over. <laughs> I really, it put a shadow on my life. <laughs> and I don't want to do it now. Yeah, we, we, we've had a question about um, is there an object you would now choose to retreat re in hindsight? And what would you do now with it? Uh, there is an object I might have chosen not to treat, which was uh, a 17th century doublet, which the curator wanted to use. And it had been treated once before, uh, and it had been, it was a 17th century doublet and the weaving, the pattern was a little gold on green and the thread, the yarn was rather flattened and like straw. It had been lined with sateen and it was all very clumsy. And me thinking, oh, I can do better than that. I can do better than that. And I could consolidate the, as the silk really was breaking up. I thought I could do it. So I took out the sateen. Right, we found the, I found quite a lot about the construction of the thing and its original lining and the cording on the edges of all the slashed uh, bodice and sleeves, which was a delight. But no way could I find a way to consolidate. It kept cracking up anyway. And I went too far and I undid some of the stitching. 
only a couple, because I found this stitching was thread, was more, the thread was more like string than anything else. Quite rough and brown. I thought, this is ridiculous, stop. So I advised then that it should be uh, um, stored as well as possible and left for study purposes only, and left alone. I regret that one quite a lot. But the sight of that string thread, stitching thread, I saw it once again on one of the valances of the Elizabeth bed in Burley House, which they were busy rehashing. And I, they wanted me to take off this fringe from the valance. I found this string and said, no, I won't do this. So we've still got the original valances on, on, the, on the bed. Uh, other parts were replaced, but not that. So nothing's wasted. You learn from everything. Yes. We've got the Lincoln Mantua on the screen. Ah, yes. Now that one was a very great project, that one. I had that, the remains, those sort of bits and pieces in my workshop for nine years because they would not find the money for the conservation and I'm afraid in the end I did it for free and it cost me what my estimate had been but at least we rescued this wonderful mantua. Natalie Rothstein uh, wouldn't believe it existed because the fabric is such is very very rare it's got a black ground uh, with the pattern with big blousy flowers on it, but a pattern of lace as well on the black is known to have existed, but no example was known. And she wouldn't believe it. She thought this was a, a Japanese copy until we got her to Lincoln and showed her the actual object. It's one of my favorite double take moments. She walked into the room. And I Ah, <laughs> it was great. But the recon that took a long time, but it, uh, it was a wonderful job to re recreate that mantua of about 1740. And we, when uh, it was, it, um, it, displayed in the in Lincoln Museum for a while. We borrowed lace from Burley of the right period for it, which was nice. And, and is it still on display or is it back in store? I think it's back in store. Most of the Lincoln stuff is in store. Yes, uh, I've done other costumes for them, but they're all in store. And um... Do you have any idea why such a remarkable silken mantua ended up in Lincoln? Did you get the back history of it? Well, uh, it wasn't, comp we got some of the back history, yes. It belonged to a family, not a very grand family, uh, who I think before the war, before in the 1930s, had actually given it to the museum uh, as long as it was put on display. Well, it was, I, I suppose it must have been hung around a dummy, but it was in a completely impossible state to display when I found it, or when they handed it over to me for uh, study and an estimate. Um, where have I got to? I've lost my chance. <laughs> well, I think we're probably moving on to the, the, the question which we had about asking you to talk about your work on the Westminster Royal Effigy costumes. Ah, yes. Well, the Elizabeth one is, was for us the most interesting. Halfway through, well, not halfway through, uh, some way through, I had a 
grand visit from the Costume Society. Because the Elizabeth effigy uh, had its actual effigy dates from 1603. The rest of it is pure theatre, 18th century theatre. I suspect that there might have been a play on or about the Queen Elizabeth or something, and the Westminster Abbey took on the, uh, uh, bought the costume or something, because there's no back to it to speak of. It's, it's very much a theatrical thing. Um, and it was in a pretty poor state, but the museum had done a job on it in 1930 and decided there was nothing of the original left which was such nonsense because the original definitely is that strange creature. But because the Costume Society wanted that displayed with its contemporary corset, we had to build, they thought I could go down the road and buy a dummy, you know, uh, to make that strange shape. We had to build it ourselves much in the way that it had been built originally, except the stuffing in the middle wasn't grass, it was a candlewick bedspread, <laughs> I think. Um, and we built it up slowly, like, uh, I think uh, the final one is unfortunately hidden under us. It's the uh, slide on the left hand, right hand side, but, um, uh, How many times do you think these effigies have been sort of repaired and... Oh, countless times. Countless times. Now, Zenzi's had another job. I don't know what she made of all the things that she found that I'd done, but uh, uh, I did my best as a conservator. There was no way I would let that 18th century pannier be left out. Mm. Although I had to leave out the corset and we had to make a new one. I made it out of spartery millinery stuff that you can heat form over the top of the the original shape and then made that shape. We had to put these weird cast lead lower legs and shoes. They're lead all cast as one piece. Onto the, there are, I've got a lot of other photographs of the, the whole thing. It was splendid, a, a wonderful job to do, completely enjoyable. Um, and how many of the effigies did you work on in total? Uh, six. The, it was the um, Duchess of Richmond, the Duke of Buckingham, Charles II. That was the museum. Nelson, Pitt, William Pitt, and Elizabeth uh, later on, once I'd left the museum. Uh, and the Elizabeth was the last one. She had, when we got her, she had knitted Angora for the, for the mink. Or <laughs> and uh, uh, I actually, what is on there now is the sort of um, uh, false mink that they use on House of Lords robes nowadays. I managed to get some. So, so do you think that was the 1930s put on the knitted mink? Yes. <laughs> they clearly didn't have a contact at the House of Lords or whatever. No, no. Uh, oh, there's, it's such a complicated case history that, that uh, it's too complicated to go into now. And, and you said earlier that you'd taken slides of all of them. Uh, are, you are you hoping to bequeath your archive of slides to, to anywhere as a reference point? <sighs> Who will want them? Uh, Really, photographs mean very little a long time later. Record photographs, 
they only ever meant really much to the photographer, uh, to the person who wanted them taken. Um, I don't know. I've got thousands of photographs. They're not all properly labelled, mind you. But um, uh, what do I do with them? I don't know. There are, I mean, we've got slides by the thousand to start with, CTs. All of the company of, since I started in 1989, um, and since digital came in from digital, which makes it worse, of course. Everybody loves just snapping away. <laughs> Yes, because I think that brings me on very neatly to, to um, sort of looking at the change section of our questions. Because I know for me that one of the biggest changes has been the move from black and white photographs and slides to digital. But um, yes. I'm wondering what other changes you, 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 you would highlight, both positive and negative. Shift from art to science. Uh, when recruiting new staff in our day, my day, the emphasis was always on the background education in a relevant field in art. Uh, say, for example, in textiles, it was um, probably textile design or technology, uh, costume perhaps, or perhaps from embroidery, always with, an, and they needed actual proof of a relevant manual dexterity. I mean, acceptable qualifications these days seem to be very much more varied and not so much uh, on the art side of things. Um, and it's the interest in the object seems to be often much more a scientific analysis of the materials present than the actual object itself for its own sake. And um, do you see that craft, knowing the craft of the material as, as, as critical or would you prefer that? Is that a better route in than science, would you say? Ah, uh, well, it all depends, doesn't it, on your what you think conservation is all about. Uh, whether you're interested at the molecular level or whether you're interested in the human level. Which way in? I think a little science can be managed. Most people can acquire enough to know what not to do. And they can always ask. The instinct of art is much more difficult to, uh, to, to acquire, shall we say, after, afterwards, after a training. So do you uh, think training as an artist um, enabled you to work successfully as a conservator? Yes, I do. Uh, um, I had um, sorry I learnt all of my first training was architecture, history of architecture, art, decorative arts, then on to fine arts. It all gave all of that and a lot of reading later has all given a background against which you can judge and put an, ob uh, an object, a new object that comes into your hands. And I can pretty often say how old it is and where it's come from and what it was used for. Not always, but uh, I've got a pretty good idea. And it's from that sort of thing that that's a kind of background that uh, that kind of knowledge comes. 
later on, I did all sorts of other things. Uh, I worked in a factory to make molds for plastic shoes, believe it or not. And the infamous uh, Candlewick Bed Bread Factory. But they all taught me something. They taught me about using tools with great accuracy in the factory for plastic shoes. They taught me about molding, about all sorts of other things that don't, don't seem as though they might be useful, but they have turned into being useful. In the Candlewick bedspread factory, I learned how to use big pieces, handle big pieces of fabric without damage to them or me. I learned about old fashioned ways of transference, prick and pounce, uh, and the kind of colored wax over uh, stitch, stitch lines, etc. All of that sort of thing. It's all come in useful. It's given me an immensely varied background to call on. So you, you've been lucky to have all that. So what skill set do you think a textile conservator needs now? Well, uh, I think I've pretty well, or it is pretty obvious already, but I think uh, you need to be able to think laterally apart quite apart from your actual practical skills which you must have just the skill to be able to use objects uh, uh, tools ordinary tools um, uh, It's that, and you must also acquire a philosophy, your own philosophy of conservation, of what it's all about. People will teach you, but it's what you think about it that matters in the end, which will influence how you approach any job for which you take final responsibility. So, so what do you think you are as concerned, you know, sorry, what's your philosophy of conservation? My philosophy is to find, explain and conserve the true nature of the object. I don't care what's happened afterwards. Okay, yes, that some social history is of interest, but my, that's my basic um, approach. If that explains itself. I, I, I think it does. Um, we've had one question that's come in about ch changes in tapestry conservation. Um, and it was, it is asking what is the biggest change that you see in the practice of tapestry conservation and um, that the reweaving technique has now been discontinued and the questioner asked what you thought about that. I think that uh, reweaving was often unfortunate because Nobody can tell exactly what was there. Uh, and it's an interference with the actual structure of the original object. If what you're interested in is the original object, then reweaving is not the way to go forward. The current practice of actually um, stitching in a sense, in a way of weaving onto a ground, the support ground, is fine, except that I think sometimes it's taken too far 
in the interests of regaining the image. Explanation of the image, perhaps, but uh, the entire regaining of it, again, is sometimes an, too much of... Uh, I lose words these days, I'm sorry, I'm old. Um, too much interference with it, of the original. Um, I'm well known for not using that particular technique, although there is going to be an object that we are going to work on next year that where we will probably have to use it. But um, the tapestries that we do don't look as though they've been conserved. They look perfectly happy but they don't have this insistence of stitching. And some of that stitching can often make, I've seen it, tapestry made like a piece of board because it's so thoroughly stitched. Sorry, I'm not, a, I don't approve of that, <laughs> or I don't agree with it anyway. Everybody has their own opinion. Um, we've got another intriguing question that's come in. Um, that says, what's your favourite invention in terms of a tool? In terms of a tool? Yes, something that, yes, I'll just read it out aloud. It says, what is your favourite Sheila made invention, tool or equipment? <laughs> uh, Sheila made in invention, or in my, in my workshop, the... Well, there is the famous next coating machine. That oh, I well, yes, the next coating machine. Well, we don't have one of those. It's, there's no, uh, we don't use net quite so much as we used to. Uh, methods have changed. Um, materials have changed a bit. I still do use net occasionally, but I don't treat it in that way. Uh, my favourite one, oh, what have we got? Uh, though it wasn't my invention. It's the padded table that came from somebody who, I think he was a, a European conservator. I think probably Viennese or something, somewhere, I can't remember her name now, who invented it. The padded board where you took out slots yes well we have one made like that and it's very handy <laughs> yeah i've still uh, got mine <laughs> there are have you yes uh oh my fan board i love that too made so it will take a fan without so all the sticks are supported all the way around and all the way through that's another of my favorites doesn't get used very often but Right, and then my my last question really for you is um, just to muse on the fact that textile conservation is totally dominated by women. And do you think this causes issues for us? In as much as directors of museums consider it as purely female and that the foot falls on costume and textile uh, exhibitions don't mean a thing so they don't give it give all that much attention to or space to textiles and costume in museums as they should I don't know that it produces any other issue I think men seem to be absolutely terrified of a needle and thread even though they're quite obviously handy with all the normal tools of screwdrivers and saws and all the rest of it. If you put a needle in a handle and call it a mounted needle, that's all right. But otherwise they're plain terrified. <laughs> Is there anything you'd like to add um, to this conversation, Sheila? Oh, uh, I may have missed out one or two things. I don't know. Um, 
Uh, let me just go through my notes for a moment and I will, I will come back to you. Um, the, I seem to have been talking a long time anyway, haven't I? You have. We've reached our hour. Right. Well, I don't know that there's anything more. You've got the essence of me. <laughs> Well, I think all it remains to say, Sheila, is thank you very much for, for, for um, giving us your time and answering your questions. Um, I been wish I had been sometimes more uh, fluent, but uh, old age is getting at me nowadays. <laughs> well, thank you very much. My pleasure. Good night to everybody. Bye. Bye. <laughs>